welcome to the Curious Entrepreneurs podcast. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, so Sam and I um, had met you at Anthropy, uh, which I thought was just the most amazing event. And I know you were kind of at pretty much every other every other minute you were pretty much on a session or getting involved in you know talking about the future of our country. So um, it was great to see you in that space. So we just knew immediately when we saw you, we just had to disrupt your uh, your coffee. And um, oh, sorry, yeah, we lost my mic's playing up. Um, there you go. Are you People back? know what Anthropy is. Yeah, I mean, we've been pretty vocal about it, and yeah. Um, yeah, our community are very aware of it. And we'll be taking a whole busload of um, young people down to uh, next year's event as well. So, mm. yeah, we've been quite vocal about it. Our community are very aware of it. And John's, John's actually um, uh, on our board of advisors for okay. our CIC. So, uh, naturally, you know, we've been involved in the process for eighteen months rather than just to, to the event. So, I think it's yeah. probably worth just obviously for those listeners that are don't don't know what it is coming straight off the bat. It'd be just good for yeah, absolutely. Echo of what it is. So, it's essentially, uh, what Anthropy uh, is and and was um, initially was a a movement um, that that culminated in a launch pad uh, down in Cornwall. At the beginning of November 2022, and um, it, it's all focused around kind of four questions. The first question was people. So, what does the quality of life look like for someone living in Britain 30 years from now? And then you had place. So, what does the infrastructure need to look like to enable that quality of life? Then you had uh, prosperity, which is what does a good economy look like to enable all of that? And then perspective, which is what message do we want to send out? As a nation to the rest of the globe, so that have you got that, naturally... have you got that written down? Very impressed. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> really? you know that, do you? I couldn't do that. Well done. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and and I think, but, but I think the message, the court, regardless of the kind of the description of it, the intention that John and his team put into it, the message they put out into the market, naturally attracted like-minded entrepreneurs, change agents, social activists, economists various different people to one space essentially for a few days and um, that's where we debated unpacked uh, percolated on things there were a lot of challenging and, conversations and that space was the eden project in cornwall if you haven't been there it was quite an amazing space to be sitting there in the hailstones yeah, cool. in this mediterranean biome with t-shirts <laughs> that made yeah. it quite special actually the, the location yeah the environment um environment is important in these sort of things i think that was one of the things that hooked me was it was like You've got to get out. You, it is, you've got to go there. You can't, if it's in Oxford, London, Manchester, or somewhere like that, you can kind of take your laptop. Mm -hmm. You know, he knows what we're like, you see, Pierce, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. He knows that we're going to dip in tonight, for an hour. In the morning. Yeah. <laughs> Show yeah, our faces. And then... Also, I, I, was, I lived in the car park in a van for three days. People kept saying to me, um, where are you staying? I said, I'm in the car park. He goes, are you that guy in the van in the car park? <laughs> I did not know <laughs> that. Said, yeah, no, I've got to be at Jakarta where... Uh, Van conversions from outside it looks like a looks like an Amazon delivery van with a window in it, but inside it's like a private jet. It's oh, got really? heated floor, central heating. Uh, what what else have been fifty five inch LCD TV on the wall, toilet, shower, um, yeah, you name it, fully sealed, insulated, the works basically. Um, you know, even have <laughs> got a water filtration system, so I kind of live in this like little bubble, and everyone else That's was freaking so out dumb. trying to get taxis to get to hotels. I was just sliding my door turning on my led lights and watching netflix man nice. well i did yeah, not know cool that that's yeah. crazy is that another yeah. side hustle of yours <laughs> yeah 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 i love no well, i've looked to start a business with a the, the genius that made it um so we're all looking at that mm. nice. oh okay right yes yeah, so we've already discovered a side hustle we didn't know about yeah <laughs> and another story from anthropy <laughs> <laughs> there are many come for it nice. so look we always start off in the same way with uh, with this podcast, um, and I hand over to Sam to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then, as I say, we've got a lot of kind of questions from our community that we'd love to ask you about entrepreneurship, um, and take us into a place where we can take some inspiration from this and um, learn from your epic experiences that you've had in your life already. Mm -hmm. Over to you, my man. Cool. So, um, what sparks your curiosity, curiosity currently um, in the world we live in today? So my, my mic's freaking, isn't it? Um, cool. So what do you mean? What do you mean by that? Do you mean like anthropy, or because you people start at the beginning, you're starting at the end. <laughs> so what do you mean? My curiosity in it could be like, so what, Yeah. So what? It could be anything in life. So what? What's that? What are you curious about currently? 
Uh, it could um, be personally, it could be in business. Yeah, so well, it changes to get older, doesn't it? So I was always mm. I was always curious about business. So mm. I, I grew up in the north of England in a mill town. So when I um when my 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 favorite subject, believe it or not, was history, and my history teacher used to talk about you know the the weavers' cottages and they were a certain size and needed big windows so they could have enough light to, you know so they could do their do their work. And I go, well, what do you mean? He go light that one over there. He pointed one out of the window. And we talk about mills, and I, and I grew up around, you know, you know, decaying mills and mills that have been converted into nice posh yuppie flats. And um, so I kind of grew up, grew up in, in the in the sort of remnants of industrial revolution. I was fascinated by it, and also mm-hmm. the the Vanderbilts, the Carnegies of the world in the US. So yeah, as well as the Stevensons and the Isambard Kingdom Brunels, all these kind of entrepreneurs of the industrial age and um, and and beyond actually fascinated me. So I was always interested in business, and I I have been. I mean, it's not. It, it was kind of about making money. And I was in business since I was 13, you know, my first business. But it was more about the process. So I'm still fascinated in business and curious about it because that's changing, the world's changing, the way in which you can operate. You know, when I started um, in business, you need to have infrastructure and offices and, you know, ISDN lines and <clears throat> hardware and racks and software and people supporting it for you. It was a nightmare. Whereas now, I'm sure this is what you talk to your uh, members about, is that, you know, the infrastructure required to start a business is very, very different, especially a sort of information economy business. Obviously, if you want to make, I've got a, a mountain bike business here. Yeah? We need laser printing, a, a 3D printing um, production facility in Wales. That's slightly different. But you can now start a business with hardly any infrastructure and mostly variable costs because fixed costs are what kill you. So that's, I'm fascinated by that. And the big things I'm curious about really so one is about, you know, talk about Moblox, my business is about helping entrepreneurs and small businesses actually em- embrace technology so they can, you know, as, as you guys believe, there's a business in everybody. So at least mm. try at least once in your life. Might not work out, but at least give it a pop. Um, might not be for you. You'll find only one way to find out. And the big ticket stuff are things like um, space. So I'm, a, I'm an investor in a company called Sen. So Charles, uh, who's the sort of um, founder, he's deploying, you know, geostationary and orbiting satellites in space of 8k cameras so provide real-time wow. video of all, real-time video of all of earth so space is um wow. the, you know, is, is you know, it's corny isn't it but this is kind of a frontier that we're now really sort of um beginning to reach back out into and that's going to change life back here on earth as well so the bigger then you talk about sustainability i've always been interested in i wrote a thesis on it when i was at university this is partly why you know, I know John was involved in things like anthropy about the social contract and how you know, corporations exist at the behest of society and all of us. So therefore, you know, they should they should do social good. Yeah. If they're not, overall, not just by making profits for shareholders, then um, yeah. you know, there's something quite wrong. So that's something that I always come back to and sort of uh, it pervades everything I do. So most of my business, like Moblox, for example, were B Corp. Um, so we're looking at the, the global goals and trying to build into the business triple bottom line, all the lots of charities. So the thing that's annoying about me is I'm probably curious about too many things. So yeah, yeah. I've, got to, I've got to try and pin them down and manage my time. That's amazing. I think a lot of entrepreneurs will relate to <clears throat> to this, but knowing that you know, you're multi-passionate, you're a multi-passionate entrepreneur and, yeah. and you've got all these different things that you you, you, you want to ding ding and actually that's quite a good thing when you're curious especially in the earlier stages of being an entrepreneur so I'll just take you back to well, the, where you the were the danger though is quickly on that is shiny object syndrome which maybe come back to because you do mm. have to at some point focus yeah 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 but if we take you back then so you said you were uh, 13 you were starting your own business you were doing your own thing well what did you realize you were did you realize that you were learning entrepreneurship then or did you just it wasn't even a conversation you were just i want to make some money um, I guess at the time, yeah, I wasn't really thinking about, oh, I'm an entrepreneur and I'm a founder and this is only my first business of many. It wasn't like that. Um, and a lot of founders, you know, when they've done quite well for themselves, they kind of they kind of reinvent their backstory. So my my first experience of business, which taught me a lot, and I wanted to know my daughter, I had a great conversation yesterday, and uh, who's like 14, and she's, she's got the bug, shall we say. And um, so I, I grew up in North of England, you know, when it snowed, it covered your car. And I had a paper and then five pounds a week, literally. So it's all down. And um, I wanted a, a shiny BMX, which is about 400 quid in 1982, three, which was quite a lot of money. My mom and dad always had a deal. I, I, didn't, I didn't grow up in, you know, in a, a difficult 
uh, economic or social or family environment. You know, I had a loving parents. My mum and dad were my role models. You know, they were probably working class background, but my mum was a nurse. And my dad were, um, went to Cambridge, had a, worked in sort of a management in a very large industrial business. So you know, they were kind of comfortable, you know. And um, the deal was, if you want something nice, we'll pay for half of it, right? So I had to come earn the other half and, you know, and then let me get on with it. So I basically... Um, my dad, one morning, he wanted to get the Sunday papers and he had to get out of bed and go and get them because they didn't deliver on Sundays. Don't ask me why, I just didn't. And I, um, I sort of said, okay, I'll go and get it for you. And he kind of tipped me and I thought, hang on a minute. And so the next door neighbor said, um, oh, he heard about this new service. So can you get this, can you do the same for me? And that became a paper round, basically. I kind of fly the neighborhood and built it. But I used to earn, it became very big. So I couldn't get the papers from the wholesalers, obviously. This is where the business side comes into it. So I had to then start thinking, as you do as an entrepreneur, well, hang on a minute. I can't buy from a news agent because I'm going to sell them at the same price because it's printed on the newspaper. There's no margin. Yeah, yeah. So where does he get them from? So then I worked out where he got them from, called the wholesaler and said, would you deliver a big bundle of papers? He said, not really, no, you're not a news agent. And I said, well, I've got this many papers. He said, oh, hang on, okay, I'll deliver. So they, you know, I see in the films, a big bundle of papers thrown on some New York yeah, streets. Yeah, yeah. I used to have one of those dumped to my mum and dad's doorstep every Sunday morning. And I'd, I'd <laughs> sort them all out, write the addresses on the names and put them in this big bag. So it was a quite hard work. So it was a big, flipping big bag. Yeah. And, um, so it, was, it, took me, it took me probably twice as long to do it, probably four hours on Sunday morning. But I was earning 20 quid, right? So now I'm starting to make money. <clears throat> um, and that was net profit, not revenue. So I was actually making nice. about 20 quid. So I, I, I kind of quadrupled my income um, by doing kind of probably, you know, 20% of the work, essentially. Um, and, at, and at Christmas, I used to do my sort of uh, Christmas tip, like 200 quid. So over a year, I was doing quite well. I did that. Nice. Uh, so, so what I learned was, going back to your question, is if you find an issue, a problem, solve it for somebody. And you can find out that this is only through trial and error. You can do that in a way in which you can make a margin out of it. And you can scale it. You could. You got a business. Now I could have, I guess, scaled it at the time, but I didn't. Wasn't thinking like that. I was quite happy, quite happy with my twenty quid. To be quite frank, I wasn't thinking about you know should I move it to the next town and build other ones. It wasn't like that. And then when it became uncool to have a paper round, I sold it as a business. It was my first exit. Uh, and it's quite interesting. I was talking about my daughter. Um, she went to a nice school in Camden in London. And I got called in one day. So you need to come and talk about your daughter. She's called Tiger. I said, oh, go on, well, she doesn't know. Uh, well, can't we just talk on the phone? No, you need to come in. You need to have a par parent-teacher meeting, whatever, the hell, intervention or whatever the hell it was. And I thought, what's she done? She's stolen the headmaster's car or something. Anyway, I get down there and they're saying, right, so your daughter has been going to the local news agent or whatever it was, <clears throat> buying rubbers, plain ones. She's been buying, I think, uh, buying five for a pound, I think. And she's been colouring them in and laminating them somehow and then selling them at a pound each. Not only that, not only that, she's been employing. No, so she, that was a story, <laughs> and then and and she's made like sixty quid. What are you going to do about it? I was like, I'm going to high five. What are you talking about? <laughs> she lost her mind the other day. I, I was with my daughter, and I, was, and I told her, I said, you know, "When I'm doing that, these things like this, I always tell the story of you getting told off at school when I started those you know, those rubbers." And she's like, "Oh yeah, yeah, my employees." I went, "Talking about your employees?" I said, "Well, problem was is that." I couldn't work out. Um, I couldn't sell them and make them fast enough. So I employed three people and gave them a pound a week or something to make them for me. And I was oh, right, okay. And she goes, and then it got worse because then I did some market research on the rubbers that the kids really liked, the pattern that, went, that sold the most. So when I realized which one sold the most, then I made more of those. So I made even more money. And I was like, she's 14 now, but she must have been like eight then. That's um, crazy. I, I love that. I love that. And anyway, the Ned Mission never spoke to me again. <laughs> wow. Wow. And what is your so what is your experience? Because we, we, something I wanted to ask because I'm so I'm a I'm a father. Uh, I was a young father. Um, he's 19 now. My my first son. I've actually got yeah, a 12 week old. Telling me, yeah. I've actually got a 12 week old baby now, so I get to re re I get to around two to to go again and. Um, it's obviously front of mind for actually a lot of the young people that we work with. It, it, it's the conversation with the parents half the time is actually a challenge. I wouldn't have an issue having a conversation with you about what we're doing to inspire young people to do that sort of thing. That's exactly what they should be doing. That's exactly what we should be encouraging. That's what I that, said. I said that's yeah, what exactly. teaching them. Yeah. I mean, yeah, so maybe 
So maybe she shouldn't have, you know, taken the dinner money off them. She should probably be barter. I kind of, I kind of gave that. But apart from that, these are the 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 skills you should be teaching them because I think you know you do in your groups as well. It's not just about being an entrepreneur, but being enterprising. Because it, it, so my view, there are two things. So my view is is that one is most of us within a generation, people disagree with me, but let me just sort of, sort of um, refine that is we're going to be working for ourselves essentially. People say, oh no, they're not. What you're talking about. And by that, what I mean is, is that large organizations don't want employees. So the zero-hour contract, right, is, the, is the, the thin end of a very fat wedge of where this is going. What companies want, businesses want, <clears throat> well, we all want, really, if you're in business, is a capable team that can deliver projects on time and on budget, you know, at a different time, but you don't really want them all the time. So I think you're going to see that the, the concept of employment break down into almost like we all become units of production, like consultants, contractors, mm. where we're put together. And they might be for a week, might be for a day, it might be for five years, like some contracts in the big banks. Um, so that's the first thing is that I think the world will change in terms of uh, the the concept of employment. And we've seen it go from my parents, who had the jobs for life, essentially. My dad probably had two jobs, two different employers his whole career. Mum had one, the NHS. Um, whereas now people change every two to three years. And I think that could change the game. Mm. So that's one thing I think we're going to see change as well and the other thing and also has been mastery and destiny as well so if you're um, not in education employment training and you know and you've had a, a, a difficult sort of background or always haven't found your way or and you feel as though you don't fit in for whatever reason then the opportunity is to become master of your own destiny and the beauty of I was saying earlier about the technology and the infrastructure available today is you can set up a business with the same capability communications ability infrastructure platforms access to talent developers whatever you need if you're about tech more now which i tend to do it's all out there for you um so that's the world's changing and i think that education the second point is education isn't changing with it so we all know that we've been trying to fix education since the uh, since in the days of the mills you know the three mm. r's you know can you can you count how many bales of cotton you produced can you can you add them up and then can you write it down? That was it. Whereas now, I think I, this is what I say to my daughters is, look, you've got to play the game, right? So you, you've got to try and get the grades, do what you want. And also, there's a bit of discipline in learning. Um, mm. Otherwise, people get lazy. So you have to learn to learn, right? Well, no matter what it is. So mm. I can start a new business and I will I get obsessed about that market and I need to understand the research. Because I've learned to learn. So my my natural state is very kind of, you met me right chatty shoot from the hip you know gut feeling if you've got experience otherwise mm. it's just stomach ache, right so <laughs> just uh, that's me but i've learned through I'm, I'm a qualified lawyer and i was an investment banker in the city so i've learned through training that i can go into detail if i need to and it counters my sort of natural state so the point is what i say to my daughter is i'm getting to your answer in a very long-winded way find out what you're good at find out what you enjoy but then be world class at it you know, that, mm. that's what it boils down to. Not not sort of, you know, half-baked, not messing around. Just find something you really quite enjoy that you're good at and be world-class at it. It doesn't actually matter what it is in many ways. If you're world-class at it, or at least you're attempting to be world-class at it, mm. you'll find a way of generating income out of it. Mm. That's bang the on, school it? system, The school system hasn't been able to catch up when the world has been changing in a linear fashion, right? We're still 50 years, maybe 100 in some cases behind. As we move into an exponential age, AI, machine learning, it will happen at some point. As that exponential change begins to happen, there is no chance the education will be able to catch up. Yeah. So you've got, to, oh, you've got to learn the soft skills. You've got to learn about being enterprising, your place in the society, in the economy, where you can add value, and then focus on that. But there's that, that And that's um, a fascinating insight. Mm. Um, I think... There's a language, it's a language issue. You know, we, we talk about, we, we, we have this conversation all the time, whether we, we, we're speaking to a vice principal or a parent or a young person. The word career and employment, these words, and actually remember, because I, I was at the same talk, I think you were, the yeah, where well, you were, because I heard you, you asked a question. You asked Sadiq Khan. <clears throat> I think you put your hand up and said, you know, um, I believe everyone, everyone is going to be an entrepreneur. Everyone's going to be self-employed in the future. What are you doing? as a government to help enable that, you know, transition. It's something that came up in a recent workshop we did with, um, we had tech in there, we had PwC, we're running it. We had uh, kind of tech in the room. We had uh, ac academia, we had manufacturing um, sector, sectors, all sorts of different kind of thought leaders in the conversation. 
And the, someone said, where's academia? And I said, wrong question. I said, where are the young people? <laughs> I said, you well, asked, oh, you know, they, they can come, they hard, can follow. Though. Yeah, it's very hard for us as humans or the status quo or you know, the institutions that already exist to comprehend and understand the fact that this is all going to go away, literally. And mm. so, you know, as humans don't understand geometric progressions, you know, they don't get it at all. And the, the thing that's helped us understand it is that one day watching some news report about there's some, someone's got flu in China, and then three months later, your kids can't go to school. That's a geometric progression. And that's the way in which that's exponential growth, essentially. And that's the way the world will change. So whether it's in five years or 50 years, at some point, machines will become far cleverer than they are now. And now it's all about really machine learning, right? It's about throwing, mm -hmm. it's about throwing data at it. It learns that it can react. Artificial intelligence is very, very different. It's a very different thing, very different animal, especially general AI, where it can just think for itself like a human. Whereas humans, we have to learn something, write a book, write a peer-reviewed paper, put it on a shelf. Someone comes along 10 years later, reads it, evolves. Whereas, whereas <laughs> software We're very inefficient, aren't we? We're yeah, very inefficient. Yeah. These machines will do that in a few minutes. Yeah. yeah. You all set it a task at night, go to bed, wake up in the morning. It would have solved that and moved on to doing other things that you didn't know needed solving. And it would solve in a way you don't understand. Yeah. When that happened, that's why nation states are obsessed with uh, AI. Because if China, to pick, pick some examples, solved it on Monday and we solved it on Wednesday, we'd never catch up because the gap, because it's exponential, would widen. It'd be, it'd be infinite. It'd be massive gap between the two. We'd never catch up. When it happens in society, there's going to be a lot of people. As that boat leaves the harbour, using these metaphors, you imagine you can kind of jump now and get onto it. But eventually, when that leaves the harbour, we'll all be working for it. There'll be five multi-trillionaires and we'll everyone working for them. Yeah, 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 yeah. And a lot of us are going to be left on the harbour. And that's not taxi drivers, forklift truck drivers, admin assistants, right? Lawyers. What's a lawyer do? Applies yeah. logic to a big data set. So they're going to move up the value curve, the value pyramid, as I call it. Accountants. Oh, it's all over. That machine does it so much better than humans. And we'll do it 24-7 without more, not making any mistakes. Um, brain surgeons, you know, when, when software can design robots that are more efficient than humans, they don't make mistakes, they don't get tired, they don't have a few bevies the night before, they don't leave a swab in a patient and, and they have some liability. You, don't, you won't need surgeons. So the, the, the machines are coming mm. for all of us. So the, the, it's the, amazing. Answer that, the answer for that is that you have to be creative. And because they're not that creative, yeah. yeah. But eventually they'll be creative. Yeah, so that that yeah, the world's changing the way that we can't comprehend. So go on. Yeah, no, that's what I was gonna. That's what we we had this conversation. Don't even get, mm. don't even get talking to him about AI, AI, AI for this. the last two days. I'll get deep on this. <laughs> um, no, that's what I'm. That's what I'm curious about. Is like right once once that infrastructure is in place and that's happening, how. What will education look like for humans? What will, how will we behave as citizens? And I think what you just said there around creativity, I think finally, actually, probably what the current education system lacks is what there's a massive opportunity in which we can actually tap well, back we're, we're into. Get into I mean, we're going to go off a complete mad like Star Trek tangent here, right? <laughs> get into, if, if, if software can write software and evolve exponentially overnight, right, it will work out how to just upload stuff into our brains. It will do. It won't need Elon Musk trying to faff around with sticking wires into pigs. It'll just work it out. It'll be it. You'll, you know, I want to learn German. It'll just upload it. Thank you very much and move on. So, does, mean, it, so does it really depend on then? It, right? So does it, so, so, so Lee, I don't think you met Lee yet, but you will at some point. You'll, you'll get on really well with Lee. A carbon coyote, uh, give him a shout, he's over in Wales. Um, he's building net zero houses to, to 2050 standards now because he, he, you know, it's, it's the right thing to do. He's not waiting for industry. Um, but we have, a, uh, we have a side hustle podcast we're looking to put out at some point in 2023 called Dear AI. So our theory, our theory is it depends what we ask it to do when we build it. So in terms of what are the intentions of the AI going into the world, so if we if the question is you know how do we how do we preserve you know life on 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 earth and how, you know how do we make um how do we help humans preserve the the earth brilliant we can work with that question if the question well, well, is will, how do we us, save the it will help us do that i think that the you know the 
the idea of you know Terminator and the machine wakes up more. No, exactly. Like, oh, potentially is nonsense. A lot of that. It will help. It, no, exactly. I think we can. Be, so if you but if you think of it like SEO, right? So that's what that's what it's you know part part of it is the search engine element of it. So you're seeing it right now with Chat GPT. It's absolute madness in the in the market. Last twenty four hours has just been crazy in particular. Um, I, I built a business in two hours last night using it just for fun because I just wanted to prove a point. Um, but the you know that level of sophistication. You say right, okay. Our theory is if we can elevate the amazing things that are happening in our communities showing communities doing things for each other great businesses building that actually mean something to their communities and are doing good in the world so the whole idea of dear, dear ai is when it goes searching it finds the projects that are great and, and elevates it that's why we're quite excited about anthropy and things like that so it's just about putting the language again it's a language thing it's just saying yeah, like let's, a, let's elevate things like open ai you know gpt for example is a it's open ai it's open source but anyone's got access to it. So what you have to do, and then, so you could bring it back down, otherwise we'll end up... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right we'll, we'll be talking about, you know, <laughs> terraforming Mars in a minute. But um, what you've got to do in business, right, let's go back to that. If you want to be curious about businesses, you've got to move up the value pyramid, right? So there's no point being in the bottom, selling the average product in the average way with the average customer service at the average price to the average consumer. You know, Amazon et al are going to eat your lunch. So... Whether you're a lawyer, surgeon, whatever, or an entrepreneur thinking about how to start a business, you may start, it may be quite simple to begin with, but as you learn, you've got to move up that pyramid. You've got to add more value to your end customer, be it a business or a consumer. And that's how, and, and be creative about it. That's how, that's how you win. You know, the, being average will no longer work because, you know, some decent large reach. I mean, Amazon, you know, all, they, all you're doing in Amazon, people say, oh, Amazon FBA, you know, let's go and spend two and a half grand on a course learn how to do that why if you're successful amazon will just oh okay the algorithm will tell amazon to go and make your doggy baskets themselves <laughs> and then you yeah, and then you're Am amazon basics are, yeah yeah. <clears throat> yeah it's mad so yeah it's mad i don't know but is that, don't don't is that the also the death of things like franchises and stuff then because you know, where you've got you know there's a few i'm not i'm not i'm not against franchises at all um, but there are historically there have been some challenges with a few of them where there's a kind of MLMs going on and, and people are getting sucked into that. They're targeting vulnerable people that are at home that want to make their own income because they have to. Maybe that's a, a life circumstance, and they're getting targeted by all this tosh. Quite frankly, on Insta, you know, we call them Instapreneurs, um, you know, and all of these kind of MLM products and things like that. It is, you know, I don't understand it. Well, like, why can't you confuse, just make your own product? Yeah, don't confuse MLM with affiliate with franchise. I'm completely no, no, thing. sorry, but you know what? You so, know what I mean? There the are... MLM. If someone is, I've got to be slightly careful because I made it. I made a business course. But if someone is uh, selling you a course on how to do something because they're so successful, they're pulling your chain. If they're so successful, they wouldn't be selling you a course. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of people out there. People want to be, they want to be successful. They don't know where to start. They haven't got the, the network. That's why what you're doing is great. I haven't got the social capital to work out. Why, how do I even start there? Where do I begin? And you've got some, you know, someone on YouTube saying, you know, send me 997 pounds and I'll, uh, I'll tell you how to be, you know, the next Elon Musk. That is not how it works. There is no shortcut. You, you have to try and I'll guarantee you one thing. You will fail. You will fail at least once, maybe twice maybe in three times you may have a success think that you can't put a foot wrong then you will fail again that's the nature of the beast is that you mm. you try you fail you learn and you, and you move on there is no silver bullet there's no course even my course right i put you know blood sweat and tears into making it i made it because there was no just bog standard no nonsense down to advice out there it was all kind of ask the universe and they yeah. will provide or you know chat to me in my discord channel for it's just nonsense so yeah. i made one to sort of make it more sort of um realistic but even then that's not going to help you build a business all it does is help you avoid a few potholes along, along the way it's all going to get on the pitch and kick the ball around i can't do that for you mm, uh, great well we actually had that, that leads into a great question because we had a question from one of our community asking about your biggest fail in business and what did you learn from it in the longer podcast um, <laughs> it's a man of many failures yeah, like yeah no. it's so we've had well it's plenty to define failure so but some failures like investments well you know i put a lot of yeah. money into things and um they didn't work out i lost my money 
I've had failures where I've been like ripped off, like fraud, but those kind of failures. I've had failures where I've built businesses um, up to 10 million in revenue, 120 employees, and just ran out of money. I had to go to sell it when it was put for administration, which was sort of soul destroying. Although no one really lost their jobs, really. People sort of went on and with the acquirer, they was cleaning up the balance sheet, but right. it's all destroying. And then you, I, I remember sitting in, um, there's one slight story there. I remember sitting in the, I had to go to the independent lawyer's office, little one, central London, to basically sign a death warrant. It was like a, uh, um, what do you call it? Like a, sort of give a, get, put his stamp on it. I'm actually yeah. a lawyer and I can't remember this, which is rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was like, um, like an affidavit almost. The lawyer had to sort of make sure that I was signing it. So anyway, so I'm sitting in his reception with this kind of death warrant, almost in tears, like completely gutted. I remember looking up at the TV and that day, Philip Green was in a select committee being grilled about where all the pension fund money's gone. I remember thinking to myself, there's always somebody having a worse day. Yeah. <laughs> so, but you push yourself yeah. off and you crack on again. There's, there's failures where you've got a business and you've launched a product or you bought another business and that hasn't worked out. So there's failures which are sort of within a business, like, products it's failures where you spend a lot of time and energy and equity and structure and, and training and relationship and just emotional energy hiring senior people into business and they just don't work out they are either mm. useless or you bring people into business you think they're amazing and they steal from you so there's a lot of different kinds of failure yeah, yeah. That we could talk about um but it, what you do you learn and and um, you move on from that and the next time you, you might have an issue but it's probably not going to be quite the same one because you can see those coming now. We, but we, but so, but Pierce, we both know many people, many entrepreneurs in the network that don't learn from those failures and and almost just go straight back in operating from a wound. We we had Danny Wallace on here recent on Series yeah. One talking about it's really important that when you're going back into market, you're operating from a scar and not a wound. So you allow that healing, that that emotional because it's emotional. You're going through trauma. So you've got to you've got to process that in the right way. You've got to have the right mindset to go back into it. So, at a personal level, forget pitching one of those failures. You've clearly got a great relationship with the word because that's why you're a successful entrepreneur. Because you it's, it's your currency to operate in failure. Like, how do you do? You have any kind of conscious practices around that kind of developing that kind of mindset to be able to deal with that failure and you know no, go I'm again. Not, I'm not that's, the organist. <laughs> Sorry. Wish I could say I was that organized, that mindset, and no. You, no but I don't know. Like, do you, yeah, how do you process failure? It's osmosis. It's like um, when you when you do anything. I also, to my going back to going back to our, our children, right? Whenever you try anything for the first time, it's just hard and it, it's tedious and it's annoying. Mm. But the more you do it, the better you get at it, and the better you get at it, the more you enjoy it, and the more you enjoy it, the more you want to do it, the better you get. It. It's a society. Yeah, it's a cycle. It's like anything. Like, I learned to play the piano. One of my daughters learned to play the drums. She, she's a judo champion as well, one of my daughters. And my, my youngest daughter got a scholarship into school for dance because she loved dancing. And she just, you know, learned off YouTube. My other, my stepson, he's learning to code. And he had a moment where he kind of wanted to give up on it because it was all getting quite tricky. And I sort of literally forced him to keep going. And now he's got over that hump. And now he's enjoying it again. And it's right. like a same in business, isn't it? Is you, you kind of learn. You, you may have a wound. It heals over. But... What you then have is kind of built into you. Then you don't, you shouldn't have to think yeah. about it. I like that. Like when there's there's like a journey, like you which you're describing is just like it's like conscious incompetence, and then it's to the point you're saying is where you come to the un, you, your unconscious competence, where it's just it's well, it's just you, you can flow. be you can be competent, but the issue um, occurs because of an external factor. Yeah, I'm lucky, no yeah. control of, like a oh, recession. Oh, 100%. Yeah, right? yeah. Or interest rates have gone up by 5, 5, 5x. And when you borrow money at the wrong time. So if you've just, if you bought a company or property or whatever it was that had available rate interest rate, you know, two years ago, uh, you, you know, you're looking at a problem. And that wasn't because yeah. you were incompetent at the time. It was like a, a great idea. But it, it, the, the things have changed, the standards have changed, and the, the wind has changed. And you have to react to it. Um, so it's like my daughter, when she's learned to drum, she'll just spend hours and hours just do one drum roll. Because you always should do is program a brain to do that. Yeah. And that's what, and that's why serial, that's why you hear somebody about serial entrepreneurs. Not that they're, you know, I know lots of serial entrepreneurs where their product, when they got to market, just didn't work out and, and they collapsed the business. But on mm. the way, they could execute with far less friction and, and uh, with fewer errors. But the actual, the end product and the market didn't work out, which is fine. Yeah. 
but they'll yeah. make the, but they weren't making the same mistakes they made the first time yeah. they tried to stop it. So what it does is reduce risk, actually. Nice. No, that's nice. great. Great. Um, no, again, we'll that's jump, good. We'll, Let's get some more questions. Yeah, we we'll jump I'm in. Keen to, on um, making sure we get all the questions. One sec, I'm just going to put it up. It's fine. So, um, like this one. Which one here? The, the, that's in line with that main barrier, bit of an extension. Yeah, so we've got one question here from Isaac that states, um, so what do you think is the main barrier to stop people from succeeding um, in their goals? Wow. Um, there's lots of different reasons. Um, mm. We have a curious, we have a very, very curious, curious community. community. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> there's yeah, where this is coming from. Let, let's pick a few off. So one of them can be, well, one of the big ones I'm quite focused on, we may mention this to you, is social capital. So there's, a, there's an academic definition of social capital, which is about the value you can extract from your, your network, essentially. That could be your mummy, dad, your neighbours, your, your, mm. your family. You know, did your great grandparents hand hand the house down to your parents, who now can remortgage it and give you twenty grand to start a business in it? Yeah, that's sort of social capital in a way. But although my my definition is a bit wider, it is, you know, it's everything about who you are, where you live, where you grew up, what postcode you lived in, what school you went to, you know, who your friends are, who your friends' friends are, and that makes a big difference and and to your ability to start a business and execute, and and also even the confidence to do it because a lot of people, a lot of people have this confidence instilled in them because they just feel as though it was almost a right that should be able to do. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just who they are. Whereas a lot of people, if you come from a background where no one you know has, has started a business, no one you know has ever raised capital, be it from you know family, friends, angels, or venture capital, no one you know is in business, uh, it can be very difficult. When I started out, everyone asked, I want to be in business. Everyone said, oh, you should become an accountant, which is terrible advice. Uh, Actually, but in the long run, I did an accounting and law degree, so it probably helped a little bit. But uh, it's terrible advice. Everyone I knew was a, a bricky, a, a builder, or a joiner, or a quarry, or you know, they kind of they did stuff with their hands, not what I wanted to do yeah. at all. So that that's one thing. The, the other ones, like, right, right with the question again. One, about, um, so it's uh, about what's the biggest what's the biggest barrier? Yeah, yeah. So um, social so, capital. I've got it. Yeah, social so capital's right? one. Yeah. So it's your, it's your network, your ability to reach out to people, to mentors, to ask for advice, to ask for guidance. Another big one is access to capital, clearly. So if you're, if you've got, you know, so I was a, on the board of British Business Bank, which also operates the startup loans company. And the average startup loan is, which is a personal loan, is 7K. So mm -hmm. That's 7K on average, the difference between someone starting a business and not starting a business. Now, a lot of people have, you know, a network or family where they can give them 7K or lend them 7k um so that's one thing is, is access to capital and that's yeah. something we need to fix because um mm -hmm. um i will say that ambition is evenly distributed access to capital and networks isn't we need to mm -hmm. connect opportunity with capital essentially and then the other one is a softer one i think is the voices in your head so often the voice in your head is saying Ooh, don't start a business don't don't do this don't do that oh it's quite risky you've got a nice job they're not, they're not really in your head. It's the people around you typically projecting. And that can be people who you love. It could be your parents. It could be your partner, children. It could be your, your neighbors, your, your colleagues. You're telling them you're toying with leaving your job and starting a business. And, and a lot of them project is that because they're, they're terrified of doing it themselves. Therefore, they think you should be as well. Now, don't listen to the voices. You know, if you've got... Um, yes. If you've got nothing to go back to, you've got nothing to lose. If you've got something to go back to, you've got something to go back to, haven't you? Um, so what's the... Win-win. The, the, there win, is a win. risk, and you've got to make sure clearly that you don't put all your eggs into that basket. So if it doesn't work out, and there's a high probability your first business will not, that you're not destitute. So you just temper slightly yeah. how much money, capital, resource, time, energy you put into it, which is yeah. why, although I hate the phrase, side hustles are a good idea. I call them rather call it a side business, so take it seriously. It's not a hustle, a business. It's quite a good place to start because then you are ability to learn, find out what works, make some mistakes mm. before you leave your job. Nice. Yeah, that's probably yeah, that. I find it quite interesting, actually, how you... Um... If you've got a job. Yeah, that's true. Can I've... I ask a question about the capital piece? Because I think it's really key um, and it's prominent in our community at the moment around access to capital. That's cool. Yeah, right. um, because, you know, I... I I did the side business. I was corporate. I, I, I didn't start my first business, like my first official business, if you like, until I was 25. 
So although I was doing a lot of entrepreneurial things when I was younger, I definitely shouldn't have been doing uh, through my own circumstances because I wasn't legally allowed to earn enough money. Earn. I was a 14-year-old father. You can't, you can't get a job. So yeah. weigh that up anyway, but that's, yeah. that's a whole different thing. Um, <clears throat> I didn't, I didn't get access to startup. I didn't know about startup loans. I didn't know about grants. You know, now we distribute millions of grants to our young entrepreneurs. You know, you've just got one for your side business. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, I'm, for that? I, I've just got seven grand, but like that's, that's fast tracked me like three to five years. So where's that come uh, from? I'm interested. Uh, this, so it's, um, um, it's off the back of a European social fund uh, through combined authorities. So they basically start up grants for, you see, in our district, because we're, we're in a devolved um, a part of Cambridgeshire. So we have we have a great relationship with our economic development team. So they have quite a oh, I'm losing you a bit there. In the way that they start up, yeah. which is very handy. Obviously, yeah. yeah. Sorry, just restart that. Um, so yeah, so we, um, so the grants that the, a lot of the curious entrepreneurs have been getting um, have been directly in line with economic development teams in our area, um, and they've got startup schemes, um, not through the banks, but through um, economic development budgets. I mean, what, grants if you can get it are, are amazing. But obviously, they're not they're not dilutive. Um, the only thing with grants is, is and not all grants, but most grants, they come with strings attached to. You might get, I don't know, in your case, you might get seven grand. We can't always use it for what you want to use it for because you have to account for it. Yeah, it's cap, so usually like, capex. It's, yeah, it's yeah. usually capital. Yeah. So, like, my mum was 90% contribution there, end, but there's like the amount of hours I've had to put in to get that grant. Exactly. So, like, but, and, and, yeah. and it's then to your point, do you have the network to support you through that journey? Um, yeah, so grants, good idea. Everything. Yeah, absolutely right. So, grants, getting about social capital, someone, you know, have you ever heard of a grant? How do you apply for a well, grant? Can you, I've had can a com you... the amount of conversations I have with you. Like, yeah. I had literally had a conversation with someone my age literally the other day going, oh, I've just got this grant. How the hell, how the hell did you know about that? So yeah, that's that's yeah. the first thing that everyone says to me. So then now well, it's... Can, a... you, can you put together a credible application? You know, you might you might not be the great at writing even. Well, AI, AI can help you. Yeah. <laughs> there you go, chat GPT. <laughs> please, please, yeah, exactly. please write me uh, an application for this grant. Put a, put a, put a URL in there. Even that, even that can be daunting for a lot of people. And then yeah. Yeah. you made a good point there is that when you're applying for a grant, it can be just as painful as it is raising equity. Um, yeah, exactly. I've got, a, I've got a YouTube channel which needs some followers, so I'm going to have a look at that. But it's called Peers Lenny TV, and there's a video on there, and it's I'm kind of standing there like this. And it says, how to raise finance for your startup. And the Perfect. model I use is is the concentric ring. So in the middle, it's people, I don't really talk about grants, it's slightly different, but it's mm. people who know you and love you, right? It's your mum and your dad. And, you know, it, they might have the money. They might be able to remortgage your house, whatever. Then you start moving to people you know, so your neighbours, your friends, your co-workers maybe, you start moving out from that. People you don't really know, you've got to sell more. They're not really investing, they're investing in you still, but they want to hear more about the business. Your mum doesn't really care. <laughs> I'll give you the money anyway. Um, now, as you, as you move out, people start to ask more questions. They need more due diligence, you need more preparation, you need more documentation, you need a presentation, executive summary, a financial model. Then you get into angels, and then you get into angel networks who basically act more like venture capital and then you get it maybe one day into venture capital and they're the concentric ring so there's no point having an idea in the shower a eureka moment and then rushing out rushing out to apply to some west coast vc fund <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean? and then but there's no point having a business you know so like, I, I forget mars i'm going to neptune and you're going to ask your mom yeah. you know, a million pounds <laughs> so you've got to you look at putting your round your round peg for a round hole yeah. <laughs> that's gold advice. that's great advice can we we'll put, uh, we link, we'll put the link we'll put the link into the, the youtube video that's gold. Um, this is why you need pierce's um a business course and we've got a, yeah. a discount for our 100 percent discount for all our curious entrepreneurs which we're forever grateful for yeah. and that's exactly why we've got so we've got a, so that's, that's right cool, yeah, that's tickle cool, me well, so let's talk about angel piece because um we can't have you on and not talk about dragon's den because how we yeah, yeah. how we recognised you was because oh, oh, we're massive fans of the program, obviously, you know, just for entertainment value, nothing else. Um, and uh, I remember you being on the the show, and I was like, "That's that's Pierce Lindy yeah, from yeah, Dragons yeah. Den." I was like, "We got to go and have a conversation." So, come on, tell me, tell us something, tell us about that experience, um, and 
Yeah. Mine was, I was actually a secret millionaire on Channel 4. That's the first thing I did. Oh, the, really? I haven't yeah, seen the, that. The, 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 the I didn't know that you've done that. There's a more story there. So, right, I come. Yeah, I, um, so I, I was in Wolverhampton and um, I spent a, about 10 days there, I think. And I spent half it in a young offenders institution, uh, Brinsford, and half it, you know, helping uh, charities, local community. And the idea of that program is you go in there, no one knows who you are, and you go and talk to these charities. And then at the end of it, you kind of, you know, you, there's, an, there's a sort of a reveal that you're this millionaire yeah. and you basically donate money. It's a charitable thing. Um, Amazing. Now, annoying, annoying at the time, I gave more money away into the local community to a dance products and things. But when they, when they made the program, they focused it purely on the prison. So I, I was in this young offenders. I didn't live there. I was living in some like squatting Wolverhampton, which was terrifying. They're like I couldn't lock the door. I had like about 20 grand's worth of camera equipment. I thought, I'm going to get, this, is, this won't be here by the end of the week. And I was in this young offenders. And I met a young lad called Daniel, a black lad, and uh, grew up in Wolverhampton, super intelligent. Um, he was helping other um, young um, prisoners learn to read, because a lot couldn't read, but I'm a, and by can't read, I don't mean struggles to read. I mean, it's like me trying to read Arabic, kind of I can't read. Yeah. And he was helping them, you know, learn to read, uh, which I thought was, you know, that shows something about him. I said, what are you doing here? Uh, so I chatted to him. And he, he wasn't challenged at school, wasn't challenged at college. And he, you know, all of his mates and him started to make a bit of money on the side, selling stuff they probably shouldn't. He had um, uh, an air pistol that was, you know, technically could be converted. It was technically a firearm. So he got, he got caught something so you, you, there's five years just there before you even start right anyway cut a long story short it's got about 11 years at 19 um so i met him in prison but about three years left and i said i want to mentor him and of course the producers all lost their mind saying we can't give a prisoner like a brown envelope full of cash and i was like well, okay fair enough i get it but when he comes out i'm going to say on a program but i mentor you so he came he, i met him he, he moved to a um, open prison so he could get out during the day and I got my team to sort of interview and find out what he liked. And, and he liked the technology. And I said to him, look, interview him to be one of our support people on the phone, right? If he's not, if you're not, if you can't do it, don't give him the job just because I know him. You know, and they said he yeah. was fantastic, got the job. And they cut a long story short, he worked for me for a couple of years. I made him redundant, which was slightly awkward. Uh, he then started a couple of businesses like a local delivery, Wolverhampton. Then he went back to work in some tech companies. And now he think he has more money than I do. You know, he earns very, very good money, like, you know, top 2% sort of stuff. Nice. His wow. family, wow. he's got a family, he's got a young a young son, did quite well for himself. I think he eventually probably end up starting a business again because he's that's sort of built into his DNA, I think. Yeah. But the point there is he had someone who, um, you know, let's face it, probably would have struggled to get a job now. He struggled anyway before he went to prison. Mm. And he was quite entrepreneurial, so he knows what could happen. Um, and he would have probably ended up, you know, going around the circle. Whereas he meets me, and all I did was say, "Look, here's some opportunities." I helped him get his first, like, I was a rent guarantor of his first flat, kind of thing. I was kind of like the uncle that he never had, essentially. Didn't Molly Collins? I wouldn't say I was a mentor. It wasn't like that kind of structured. It was just I was just there on WhatsApp to ask a question when he needed to ask one, Amazing. and I opened a few doors for him. And look at him now. And that just shows you the difference that it can make by helping people out at, at that point in their life where. It's like firing a bullet, isn't it? You might be a millimeter off here, but 2,000 meters downrange, you will not hit a house, quite literally. And whereas if you help them make that change here, mm. downrange, their life's completely different. So that mm. was my story from the uh, Super Millionaire. Man, that's and then, amazing. And, that's and, then, and I know him to today, he texted me like two days ago, actually, talking about getting another job, even more money. <laughs> Whoa, um, it does so it. Well right, great. Then, so through that, I got, obviously... Um, I was I was on the radar of, of, of researchers. I was approached to Dragon's Den. And the first year, Lou asked me, I didn't really want to do it. I was a bit reticent and it ended up someone else did it and whatever. And then they approached me again because I tick boxes, right? I grew up in a mill town, you know, did my film 11 plus, <laughs> went, ended up being a lawyer in the city, then a banker, then made some money and I was on TV. So I tick a few boxes. And they wanted me to do it. And I was thinking, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I want to be famous. I'm busy. Um, I had a taste on, on Channel Four, but it was kind of, it was kind of, it was a, a momentary thing. It came and went, and people forgot who yeah. you were. Dragons Den was a different ball game altogether. Yeah. I, I don't know, I was probably nervous, wasn't I? To be honest with you, because it was kind of a quite a big thing. Anyway, kind of a long story short, I was away as you do with Sir Richard Branson, his private game reserve in the Kruger National Park in South Africa. 
We wow. Just, we'd landed on a turbo prop with him and his family and given some money to his charity. So I was on this trip with him, which was amazing. We went to Soweto, worked with the entrepreneurs there in the townships. It was fascinating. Uh, he, had, he had a Branson uh, Entrepreneurship Centre there then, and he closed it, but they may have reopened it now. And um, after that, we went to his private game reserve. And I was there with the producers ringing me. Who can I talk to about business and the media and how you combine the two and the pros and the cons? And the obvious answer was Sir Richard Branson. So we ended up having a conversation, and he, just me and him, literally, having a bottle of Corona. Again, <laughs> this is all true. It's not some reinvented backstory. And we're sat there on this table, on this, it's like a rocky outcrop in the bush with like yeah. a six star hotel on top with an infinity pool sticking out with a satellite dish sticking out on top of it. It's like a James Bond lair. And I said, you know, I was telling him about Dragon's Den. He goes, look, you should do it. You'd be good at it. Why not? He said, the media is very powerful. I used to get on a plane for a decent news spot. He said, you know, screw it, just do it, as he did, because he wrote the book near the time. Yeah. And I got up to walk away. And he said, I go, thank you. That was great. Thank you. I'm like, okay, I'll do it. And I got up to walk away. And he said, come back here and made me call the producer, who I still know to this day, Kerry, and uh, <laughs> tell him I'm in. And that's where I ended up on Dragon's Den. Wow. When I was on it. <laughs> and, and then literally, it was kind of like, I think it was like a little screen test to make sure you didn't completely freak out for half an hour. Other than that, you turned up on set on the first day, bit of makeup, obviously I needed it, bit of makeup, sat there, hello, Peter, hello, Deborah, and cameras, lights, action. That's mod, cool, and yeah. comes out the lift and off you go. And I was the That's first so to do tech. So I did... Um, Lost my name wonderfully, which was just personalized children's books. Yeah. It was the first yeah. kind of, it was the highest valuation Dragons then for until about a year ago. You got 2 million valuation, 5% for 100 grand. Um, and they sold that business. The number's not public, but for a lot of money um, a couple of years ago. Uh, and the, the founders actually, they're multi millionaires now. They've gone again to build it even further. Um, but I, I exited. So I did very well at Dragons then. Nice. And I think that's one of the, most successful proper deal in Dragons Den where I invested. There was a period of time where we grew a business yeah. and we exited it. A lot of the things you know about, they never actually exited. They're just kind of making money. That was a proper sort of, my portfolio was like a venture capital portfolio. One flyer. Um, yeah. Four got my money back. One, I lost my money. And three didn't happen in the end. Yeah. It's a pretty good conversion, really. And, and do you get... Do you much like the story you told around uh, the gentleman? I didn't catch what's what's the man's name from the yeah, from Daniel. the sea, Daniel. Daniel. Um, were you how involved did you get in that? Would you do the same? Would you just be there? Hey, I'm here to signpost, or did you want to get in that business and support them on the ground as well? The ones oh, you sorry, you mean so you mean lost my name in that business? Um, um. So initially, I was a little bit involved, but more on the PR side and marketing. These guys were like, you know, they had a venture capital term sheet already and there were four Israeli, I think, a PhD. So like, what was the lot right, to okay. like? They're doing, to be quite frank. And then very quickly grew into a business where they need my help. I just, I'm just getting in the way. So they, they just got on with it. And they, they went for a rocky pack. It wasn't all easy. They were on a growth trajectory, raised loads of money and they were losing, losing a lot of money. Went to, meant they need to raise more money. And they actually stopped, um, restructured the business and the team, downsized, raised a little bit more money. And went for profitability, not just growth. And that's what mm -hmm. turned them around. So they went through a very difficult um, patch, which they found very hard to um, you know, downsize a team that they'd uh, built over quite a few years. Um, but in the end, you know, that's what you need to do sometimes. It's not, mm. it's not personal, right. it's business. Mm. And I, and I'm curious about, obviously, the story you've just told about um, when you were doing that kind of under, undercover kind of millionaire um episode and well program and then obviously experience with dragon's Den. what what's the number one thing you look for when investing in businesses but also people well it depends on where the business is at right so yeah you've got a continuum so at one stage there's hi my name's you know jane i've got an idea for business what do you think would you back me at the other extreme you've got a utility company right with jane you're backing jane right you're not really you might back a business it's probably going to change massively by the time it gets to any scale probably going to pivot a few times but you're backing yeah you want to hear the plan you want to hear what they want to do you understand the market you think there's an opportunity it's not completely barking once you cross that rubicon it's all about the the individual you're investing in so dragon's yeah. den really is about yeah the business you want to hear that makes kind of holds water but it's more the individuals mm. So what's when the you, number when one you, thing? At the other end of that continuum, utility company, right? 
you know, they know how much money is going to come in the door for the next 20 years. You know, if the whole management team and the board of directors disappeared in some horrible fatal air crash, it wouldn't matter. You'd be placed them and carry on. But in startups, uh, and then if you've got a startup where, you know, that they've, they've raised some money, they've got a product, and now, now you start to look, okay, now you're looking more at the, the metrics, the numbers, the market, the conversion ratios, you know, the, you might be looking at, you know, lifetime value, customer acquisition costs. You start to look at metrics, but then you're still very much looking at the founders, founder, then do I think they can execute? And can I work with them? I've had businesses mm. where so there's a, there's businesses. A, can, can they can they execute? Can, can they, they execute? Or, or and can that, they, they like, obviously a lot of them can't, but can they learn to execute? Or are, are yeah. they good leaders? Yeah. That's and, another big one. Yeah. And how but how how are you thinking? So in that in that two, three minute window, what can you see within within them? Well, it's never two or three minute window. Um that's a fallacy. Oh, is it? But even, uh, even, even on Dragon's oh, Den, okay. don't forget that. Yeah, in Dragon's Den, you might see an um, edited pitch. It's probably about 12 minutes. Oh, but they okay. were there for at least an hour, an oh, hour okay. and a half. I mean, you're, okay. never, you're never going to part with 50 grand on a three-minute elevator pitch unless you're barking. Yeah, yeah. yeah and then don't okay. forget, Dragon's Den, <laughs> when, you, when you shake the hand and you do the deal, right, the cameras go off, they don't care anymore. They're going to make a TV program. You are now making an angel investment. Yeah, you yeah. do legal, financial, yeah. commercial due diligence. Sometimes you find out they've told you all the porkies. Uh, so you walk away. Or sometimes oh. they, they're quite cute and they wait forever till it goes out and get a better deal. Mm. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. so it's, it's not yeah. a three minute, here's my pitch, the dragons have a bit of an argument and hand over 50 grand or even more. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. Well, so it is I've real just got though. One more it is real though. You don't stop. You don't. It, yeah, is, yeah. it is real time. It's filmed, but they edit it into a story. So you might say that. Piers is not invested in his business because he doesn't understand the brand. Actually, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't invest because it's a subsidiary of a Canadian company that's got a franchise. Why the hell would I invest in that? Makes no yeah. economic, makes no structural sense whatsoever. But that's too boring for TV. So right, that's okay. I didn't invest because he started crying. All right, okay, that's interesting. Well, interesting. Okay, okay. I've, I've only just got one question. Obviously, yeah. I'm mindful of time. Um, if you had your slot on the current Dragon's Den um, to pitch for Moblox, how would you deliver it? Oh, that's a good question. Well, so, so Moblox is about helping small business and entrepreneurs embrace technology. So the UK small businesses are not as productive as they should be compared to the competition. And the big reason is they're not embracing technology. So what Moblox does is help them understand technology through content and want to make a better informed purchasing decision. Ideally, they buy it from Moblox or through Moblox. And some things we're reimagining, like Moblox Mobile, we built a mobile phone network based on, on the UK's number one network for entrepreneurs. But there'll be other things we resell. There's also a marketplace. That's what Moblox is. Mate, I'm in. Moblox is to technology and small business services what the neobanks, you know, your tied Starling Revolutes, are yeah. banking. It's the same model. Right, okay. It's nice. about time, honestly. Should have dropped that. Should have dropped that roadcaster. Then just it yeah, might drop well, the that was great. That was a pitching masterclass right there. <laughs> nice. Oh no, amazing. Well, look, I think I, I, um... I have got a round of applause button. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes. Come on, hit it, man. No, because I'll, I'll hit the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> I need to tag them. <laughs> like oh, it. Pierce, this has been absolutely fascinating. And um, so, if if people want to find out more about Moblox, because uh, that was a, what we wanted to finish, make sure that we get that in there, because. We are quite excited about it. As someone who's oh, wrestled with um, this challenge as a business owner, uh, as a small business owner, um, it's been a pain in my butt for a very long time. Yeah, so my, my box is it's about that, but it's about building a community. Right? So you yeah, think yeah. About, if, I, if I ask anyone watching this, what is the UK SME small business entrepreneur brand? There isn't one. There isn't mm. somewhere you can go to that you trust for content advice, guidance, community, yeah. to converse, communicate. It doesn't exist. So that's part of it. But obviously mm. what we want to do then is create services that are built and designed for small business and entrepreneurs. Because most services are not. They're built for big companies. They try and cut them down for small companies. Yeah, yeah. So our mobile phone network is, you know, is eventually, if you buy enough services from us, your mobile yeah. will be free. But we've done a deal with the number one network to create something that is better, cheaper, simpler. And, uh, basically faster in many ways in terms of our ability to develop that based on our community's feedback 
Nice. Amazing. Yeah, it's Love a that. perfect good loop, and hence why it's uh, also a B Corp, which um, you you touched on earlier. Um, and and, and, and you, you could join for free to be a member. Obviously, even mobile, you pay for that. But you know, you mentioned you get, you're going to hand out a link to my course. But yeah. the whole idea really is, is they think about what Piers does or has done for the last 10 years. Yeah, I've kind of rolled it into a business almost. It's just helping people be successful or more successful. Nice. Love that. Brilliant. Well, we're so happy to have you um, here to talk about all of your journey. And um, I hope you enjoyed that as well, getting getting curious about entrepreneurship yeah. with us. <laughs> um, and there's so much more we could have covered as well. So maybe yeah. we can get, get you back in a, in series three or series four of our podcast to unpack more of the, the, the journey. The journey. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, if you please do, everyone, connect with um, Piz Services. We've got links to it all in the, the bio. Is there a specific platform? I mean, I follow your content Mobilox. on Instagram. That's the platform. So I mean, think, following you and your you personally, because I, I follow oh, you on Instagram. LinkedIn, and you're... Instagram, they're the best ones, really. Okay. So LinkedIn, we, we Instagram. We started TikTok, Moblox TikTok. Um, ah. Yeah, so there's, there's kind of peers and Moblox, but they're kind okay. of, there's, there's an overlap. But they're definitely, mm -hmm. um, follow Moblox on Instagram. Help us on okay. TikTok. And for me, really, got my YouTube channel, there's a lot of stuff on there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. On 1,000 films. YouTube is hard work, man. That's like a, a vocation YouTube. Uh, Instagram. Uh, I just got verified because someone was someone copied my account basically. I saw that. Yeah. Twitter's more me, you know, shouting at the universe. Um, <laughs> and then I guess LinkedIn is a big one, but LinkedIn's not for everyone. No. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Well, we can find. We can. We can put the relevant links in there. Nice. So well, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No. I'm just extremely grateful. Absolutely loved it. And I've I've still probably got a few more curious questions for you at a later date. So if you don't mind, I can pick my maybe. Back help with your content as well and then we can share yeah, you tag us well. up on the stories maybe you get some responses on your insta and we can yeah, yeah, okay. do some back and forth yeah we'll do yeah. that yeah yeah well, thanks, thanks right, thank you very much